Happy New Year. Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm Ernabelle DeMillo. Thanks for joining us. This month, we're at Japan Society's For a New World to Come Contemporary Exhibit. Let's take a closer look. Experiments in Japanese photography and art from 1968 to 1979 captures the works of 29 Japanese photographers and artists who created a new form of visual expression in the wake of political unrest in Japan. This was a pivotal moment in the country's history as it was going through social and cultural change. Each section reflects the mood of that period, from Daido Moriyama's modern urban landscapes to Shigeo Gocho's snapshots of his personal experiences. And here's what's coming up on our show. And be sure to follow us on Facebook at Asian American Life. Breaking barriers, Paul Lin meets one of America's youngest politicians. Canvas and silk, Kyung Yoon gets to work with designer Richard So. Move over sriracha, Minnie Roe reports on why kimchi's become the hottest food trend. Plus Korean Latin food and grannies cooking for the holidays. 24-year-old Jonathan Wong is one of the youngest Asian Americans in elected office. Paul Lin met up with him recently and has more with the political newcomer. I'm Paul Lin. We're meeting Jonathan Wong. At 24, he's one of the youngest elected officials in the U.S. And he's still pursuing a legal degree here at Brooklyn Law School. Jonathan, the student, earns his law degree in 2017. A licensed real estate broker in New Jersey, his focus at night right now, real estate loan closings and corporate tax law. Brooklyn's great because of the uh, wide variety of clinical offerings that they have. It really gives uh, the future lawyers, students, uh, hands-on experience with clients. Outside law school, Jonathan's getting plenty of hands-on experience as a New Jersey politician, more specifically a councilman helping his constituents in Mawa Township. Residents will always come to me with their concerns, uh, they will, they will hopes uh, as well as you know messages that they want to convey to the community. Jonathan ran for a council seat in 2013, the year he graduated from Baruch College. A close finish gave him hope, so he ran again the following year. Despite a crowded field, 11 candidates, and opponents pointing out his youth and inexperience, Jonathan won a council seat running on a platform of transparency in government and low taxes. Jonathan, please repeat after me. I, Jonathan Wong. I, Jonathan Wong. Do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United and States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. It didn't matter that I was inexperienced because I was running to make good decisions for the town. Does this affect Mao in a positive way? How does this, does this preserve our community? and uh, how does this affect future generations. Representing the youth of Mawa was just a piece of Jonathan's support base. He had to earn a broad cross-section of the township's voters. You have to have a good message for all the residents. This includes um, all varieties of income, all variety of races, all variety of ages. Uh, I know that seniors, they really like to go out and vote. Increasingly, so do Asian Americans. A UCLA report projects the number of registered Asian American voters to double in the next 25 years, from 6 million now to more than 12 million in 2040. And one out of every three Asian Americans will be a registered voter. In Mawa, the last census showed Asians made up roughly 8% of its population. Jonathan is half Filipino on his mother's side and half Chinese American on his father's side. For Jonathan, the idea of Asian American representation in U.S. government is a huge deal. He hopes others will be encouraged to run for office and take pride in public service. Asian Americans are underrepresented in government, and which is a shame because, I mean, this is our home too. Uh, but we've been on the rise. In fact, the number of Asian Americans in public office, a UCLA study showed, has reached historic levels to more than 4,000 across the country. Jonathan's achievement seeking public office and, at 23, winning a seat in local government earned the recognition of the Filipino-American community. Now, you recently received an award at Carnegie Hall, the Outstanding Filipino-Americans in New York, TOFA. Uh, talk about that scene. It was a, an amazing experience being able to see all of these uh, Filipino-Americans who just take the community to just another level. I am speechless, the fact that I was even considered to be a part of this. 
Every step of the way in Jonathan's political career, his family has been there to support him. His parents, as well as his sisters, Sarah and Leah. One of the nice things about having sisters, they'll also, they'll critique me and they'll be, they'll be pretty honest about it. Overall, they've been very supportive and my parents, they always told me, even my first election, they're like, you're gonna win. Looking to the immediate future, Jonathan aims to earn his law degree in 2017. A visit to the Philippines, his mother's home country, may be in the works. And, of course, there's his four-year term on Mawa Township's council, where he's promoting the idea of televising government meetings. Televising meetings is important regardless of how many people watch it, so long as it's economic feas feasible for the fact that it promotes transparency. So, Jonathan, what happens next? What aspirations might you have for a higher office? Run for a White House sometime down the road. Doors open. Yeah, why not? Why not? Being considered to be a candidate for the White House, I mean, that would just, that would be amazing. Whatever Jonathan Wong decides to do, he's sure to be an inspiration to Asian Americans and anyone interested in U.S. politics. I'm Paul Lin for Asian American Life. Kyung Yoon in Tribeca with the artist Richard Tsao, whose works are inspired by his Asian roots, but with a completely contemporary and colorful take. Richard Tsao has called New York home for more than 30 years, but his art is dotted with colors and influences from Asia. His recent exhibit at the Art Projects International Gallery in Manhattan is a good example. These are my works on paper. It's called Rounds. This body of works actually was inspired by Chinese bronze mirrors that I saw uh, when I went, was at the National Palace Museum in Taipei uh, many years ago. The oil paint is applied onto round plexiglass, and there are many, many layers, just like the mirrors themselves has a lot to do with many layers of polishing and polishing until the owners can actually see the reflection of themselves. It's really a process uh, that he takes uh, so much care in making his art and is very sort of well thought out. Also has uh, connections to his signature work that's produced in his studio he calls Flood Room. The Flood Room is where Richard Tsao has created his unique signature paintings inside a completely sealed and waterproof studio that is kept heated at 110 degrees. His technique is like no other artist's. He mixes his own pigment and paint with marble dust on canvas. The pieces are soaked, dried, painted, and flooded in a process repeated over many years, a labor-intensive art form that creates an encrusted alchemy of colors and textures. They're bumpy. Um, they're like more like outer space terrain or landscapes that we see from satellite pictures. The process is very tropical in a way because I grew up also with lots of flood. I guess everything that I do in terms of my art or my design is very influenced from my childhood. Richard Sal was born and raised in Bangkok, Thailand, a country flooded not only with monsoons, but with the vibrant colors of tropical flowers, food displays, and the hand-woven silks that he vividly remembers from his childhood. Thirteen years ago, on a visit home to Bangkok, he was inspired by the beautiful silks of his homeland to try his hand at a very different art form, working with fabric. Richard started designing women's clothing, he says, at first just for fun. Since then, it's turned into another creative outlet for him, with his designs being sold in museum shops throughout New York City and even the Metropolitan Opera, where his Carmen jacket and the Pagliacci jacket are popular sellers. His studio in Jackson Heights, Queens is brimming with design ideas and color swatches that turn into luminous and multicolored jackets, scarves, and accessories. I like color, so it seems like the silk as a medium works very well for what I desire. I grew up with beautiful Thai silk. I was always fascinated with seeing a silk being hand-woven. I'm very happy that the tradition is still very much alive. and. Um, I, I work with these wonderful silk weavers who actually weave the silk specially for me. It doesn't need to scarf, but it really makes it a lot more festive. Yeah, yeah a yeah, lot absolutely. more fun. 
Richard occasionally enjoys dressing friends like Anna Bonfi, who is visiting from Milan, Italy. It's and, fun. It's so much fun. And red is really her color. It is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Everybody has a color, and I, red I, is her color. Yeah, I wear red yeah. Red and just like green is your color. Yeah. So. Well, so now <laughs> the, the artist has spoken. Yes. <laughs> so actually, the two of you together is quite. The colors are quite okay, something. Yes. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm going to wear uh, uh, Richard's uh, clothes to La Scala, and I'm sure that everybody is going to ask me, oh, where did you get this wonderful coat? And I say, in New York. <laughs> I don't know whether I have any uh, specific ideas in terms of the concept of my clothes, but I like fun and festive, but I think that's a little bit of my philosophy in life. A little bit of festive, a little bit of fun helps because I think we all work so hard. <laughs> How do you see yourself as an artist first, designer? I would consider myself a little bit of everything. Artists making paintings was always my first passion. So I consider myself the accidental designer. And I really did not think that uh, it would continue for this long, but uh, happily it has. And Richard says he's looking forward to finding new ways to keep expressing himself as a painter, and now as a fashion designer, as long as it's all injected with a huge dose of fun. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. We know nobody cooks like Granny, and that's the idea behind a popular web series called Cooking with Granny. But the show is more than the sum of its ingredients. I met up with a woman behind it all, including one of the stars of her show. What are you going to teach me? I'm going to do the buko pandan. And translate that. What is buko pandan? Buko pandan is coconut uh, jelly. Meet Lumen Castaneda, who welcomed us into her Jersey City kitchen. The 74-year-old grandmother, a.k.a. Lola, is one of nine immigrant grandmothers featured in Caroline Chin's web series, Cooking with Granny. When I was growing up, we didn't have a refrigerator. There's no supermarket. So my mother used to wake up at 5 o'clock. Um, what was it about uh, Lola Lumen that you said, this grandma needs to be on my show? Well, as you can tell, she has tons of charisma, right? And it translates on screen, so I needed to have her just based on her appearance and her personality alone. What really got to me was that she was a public school teacher in the Bronx after living in the Philippines. Shin's grannies have more than just recipes to share. They also have stories. That's the secret ingredient to Shin's show. We don't know where try to go out of war, but on the way, a lot of time, they bomb us. Stories like Nina Ishkin, who survived the siege of Leningrad. My show really documents the lives of very strong survivor women. So whether it's surviving a war, which is the case of the Russian Jewish grandmother or my own grandmother, um, or also not simple, but the more general hardship of immigrating to New York. Um, or in the case of Grandma Louisa, um, it's about surviving domestic violence. Shin came up with the idea for the show when she was in grad school. She wanted to preserve immigrant culture through food. She raised funds through Kickstarter, and her first couple shows starred her very own grandmother. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Cooking with Granny. Hello. <laughs> Um, so today we're going to be making something really simple. It's just going to be pork belly with a sesame oil dipping sauce. Viewers learn how to make a popular Korean dish while also learning what life was like for those living in Korea during the war when the Soviets occupied the North. It's an interesting combination of storytelling, but for Shin, it's what makes her show stand out from other cooking shows. She also shows us just how resilient these women are and how happy they are to share their favorite family recipes, because food is what connects us all. The food is very important in the Filipino community because uh, the grandmother, the mother, and then your aunties, they're all cooking. But today, she's cooking for us, 
a party and holiday favorite in Filipino homes, Bukupandan. This is uh, what I use for the jelly. This is the jelly. This is alsa gulaman. And that's why sometimes it is called uh, pandan gulaman. And we're going to use the, uh, the coconut. This one is the coconut gel. This one is the sugar palm fruit. And then we're going to mix it with the Nestle table cream and a little condensed milk and the pandan concentrate. First, she makes the jelly, adding water to the powder and waits for it to boil about 15 minutes. When it starts boiling, she adds half a tablespoon of the concentrated pandan. Pandan is a tropical plant. When that's done, she pours into the mold and waits about 20 minutes for it to set. In the meantime, she mixes the ingredients, the sliced coconut meat, one can of coconut gel, the sugar palm fruit, the Nestle table cream, and condensed milk. All these ingredients available at your local Asian grocery store. Then the mold is ready and she slices the jelly into bite-sized pieces and then mixes it all up. And there you have it, buku pandan. It's ready to serve and eat with friends and family. When you look at the different cycles of, gener um, of immigration here, um, there are certain recipes that are being lost along the way. Food is one of, is food is a component of a culture, the most delicious component of culture, so that kind of gets lost. But in the digital age, with video storytelling, with YouTube, you know, I can preserve these stories this way. And pass it on to generations to come. And speaking of spicy food, a Venezuelan chef won over the taste buds of Korean food critics with her Latin Asian cuisine. Let's take a look. Korean and Latin food are a match made in heaven because you can play with the ingredients and you're gonna have really, really a good mix at the end. The food is not much different because the concept of the food, Latin and Korean, is to share and to make people happy. Latin food is vibrant, it has a lot of colors, and it's fun. And the same thing that I discovered is that Korean, they add that to their food. Like they have that colorful plate, and, and the table has to be colorful, so it's like, it's like a really good combination. The dish that I'm gonna prepare is a fusion between Korean and Latin food. First, I'm gonna make the bulgogi, which is the Korean barbecue. And I'm gonna use green plantains and avocado, which is big for a lot of Latin countries, especially for us. Uh, I'm from Venezuela, and we use these um, ingredients mostly every day. Can you smell it? So we're doing this just to make it a little creamy. It's not a guacamole. <laughs> it's just a creamy avocado, just lemon or lime. Here on the side, green plantain. I never wanted to compete before, never thought I was going to win. I wanted just to go for the experience and to have fun cooking my dish that I created. It was my baby, but I was fortunate enough to win the first place. And winning the competition here is what gave me the opportunity to travel to Korea. Uh, New York was the preliminaries and the final competition, semi-final and final, was going to be in Korea. Once there, I was competing with 15 people from other countries around the world, and we had the opportunity to go to the semi-finals. 
and five people were selected to the final. It was a great opportunity to be there. It was a learning experience and it changed my life. I had the honor to meet the Korean president here in New York. She made an appearance at the Korean Cultural Center and she gave us the honor, me and another 15 people, to be honored as a Korean cultural patron in New York. And we are the first ones to receive such an honor. So it was a really, really important day for me. As a Korean patron, we have to promote not just culture, but also food, technology, and more people visiting, either here in Koreatown as also in Korea. Every event that is being uh, held here in New York, I'm part of it, I go, I learn, and probably one day I'm gonna be able to just like give classes about Korean and Latin food. And the final touch. Buen provecho. I'm Minnie Ro. A Korean meal without kimchi is like having an Italian feast without pasta. This national dish of Korea was until recently known to the world as that stinky, spicy, garlicky cabbage. But kimchi has become the new darling of the global culinary world. These days, it seems kimchi is everywhere. There's kimchi tacos, made famous by Roy Choi's food truck sensation back in 2008. Giada De Laurentiis cooked up a kimchi pancake on one of her Food Network shows. Whole Foods has dedicated an entire shelf to kimchi. There's kimchi flavored tortilla chips, kimchi chocolate, even kimchi flavored soda. Yes, kimchi is enjoying a boom lately, thanks to the recent popularity of Korean food and the rise of Korean American chefs like David Chang of New York City's Momofuku, Huni Kim, chef and owner of Tanji, the first Korean restaurant to receive a Michelin star. And there's the ever popular Philip Lee's kimchi taco truck. But kimchi is not just a passing fad. In Korea, it is indisputably the national food with a long-standing history that goes all the way back to the 7th century when Koreans began experimenting with salting and fermentation to preserve food. In a country with four distinct seasons, it was a way to ensure that essential vitamins and minerals found in vegetables could be enjoyed all year round. There are dozens of different kinds of kimchi. The most well-known is pechu kimchi, made from Napa cabbage. But there's also oi kimchi, made from cucumber, gakdugi, from daikon radish, pagimchi, spring onion. In fact, you can make kimchi out of almost any vegetable. Each region has its own particular flavor and style. The hotter the climate, the more spice, salt, and flavorings are needed to preserve the kimchi. Northern Koreans use less red pepper and salt, whereas the more south you go, the spicier and saltier it gets, relying heavily on preserved fish. And every family has their own recipe. In many ways, kimchi is more than just food. It's a legacy. Traditionally, every fall, families would gather to do kimjang, the annual kimchi-making event to last through the winter. It's not just about making kimchi, but also about passing down family recipes, bonding with loved ones, and sharing the fruits of their labor. In 2013, UNESCO recognized kimjang as an intangible cultural heritage item. Ellen Blau has fond memories of living in Korea as a child and doing kimjang with grandmother, mom, and aunts. Tell me a little bit about like the kimchi making that you were familiar with as a child. It was always, in Korea, it was always cold um, and we were always running around and then grandma would be yelling at us to stay away. And I feel like they had like crates of this cabbage and you could smell it and you could, all, when grandmother you know, touches her face, you could feel the spiciness of her hand because they didn't wear gloves. When I smell it, I remember that. And I remember tasting, I mean, it was like a candy. My brothers and I used to fight over who's gonna get the next. Mm. The little piece of yellow cabbage with a little bit of radish thrown in our mouth by our grandmother, we used to fight over that. 
However, even in Korea, fewer families are making kimchi during Kimjang, as the number of multi-generational families living under one roof diminishes. And with kimchi readily available at every supermarket, a growing number of people are opting to purchase kimchi instead of making it. Blau says she wants to continue the tradition as long as possible. I want to learn everything from mom. I mean, because not just kimchi, but my, making all the sauces and things like that. And I look at my daughter and I'd like her to understand the world wasn't always like this. I also wanted to learn how to make kimchi, so I asked Blau's mother, In Suk Shin, to teach me her technique. So tell me, so you buy, you buy the cabbage, and then what do you do in the first step? She says, cut the cabbage and put it into a salty water bath. Then take a spoonful of salt and sprinkle on each cabbage leaf until it wilts. Next, she makes a spicy mixture of radish, apple, garlic, green onion, chili powder. The final ingredient is a dollop of starch to aid in fermentation. Shin favors cooked oatmeal. She then spreads the mixture on each leaf, wraps it up, and into the bottle it goes. At the end of the day, Blau had bottles of kimchi to take home. If fermented properly, it should last a couple of months. But the memories with the time spent with her mom will remain long after the last leaf of cabbage is gone. Last but not least, kimchi is good for you too. Packed full of the probiotic strain lactobacilli, a bacteria also found in yogurt. Kimchi also has anti-aging and anti-cancer benefits, promoting brain, colon, and skin health. And best of all, kimchi can help you lose weight. So what are you waiting for? I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. That's our show for now. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to like us on Facebook at Asian American Life. And don't forget to stop by the Japan Societies for a New World to Come, Experiments in Japanese Photography and Art. I'm Ernevel DeMillo. We'll see you next month.